far as I remember, that was the last thing we talked about. So we talked about medication, we talked about vomiting. Um, before we move, so pretty much we are moving to the uh, chemistry of the diet. Okay, that's pretty, it's going to be pretty exciting. Uh, you may see I've got some papers over here to show you that never trust scientists. Okay, um, but before we move on, you know, like a few words about how we absorb electrolytes in water. We talked about the absorption of carbohydrates, absorption of amino acids, absorption of lipids. What about water and electrolytes? So the mechanism is pretty straightforward. So if you would look at this cell, your left, okay? You see that? Do you remember what apical and basal, lateral or basal side of the epithelium is? If not, I can remind you, so the apical side is the one that faces the lumen of intestine, okay? So this is where the lumen is. And at basolateral side here, you're going to find the basement membrane and you're going to be like extracellular fluid and stuff. So far, do follow me. Here's the deal. At the basolateral side, there's a pump. Sodium potassium pump. So it pumps sodium out of the epithelial cell into the blood. Does that make sense? Since the sodium is pumped, now when I say into the blood, eventually sodium is in the blood. It doesn't mean that there is a protein that extends all the way from epithelial cell to the blood vessel. Sodium goes into the extracellular fluid first and then into the blood. So, okay. Does that make sense? So sodium is pumped out of the epithelial cell. So concentration of sodium inside of the epithelial cell is low. We good? Clear? It is not just low. It is lower than concentration of sodium in the intestinal lumen. So sodium can simply diffuse from the intestinal lumen into the epithelial cell. Does that make sense? This green arrow shows you the diffusion. What's going to happen to sodium in the epithelial cell? Is it going to stay there? No. What's going to happen to it? It's going to be pumped into the ECF. Does that make sense? So pretty much Sodium potassium pump maintains the low sodium concentration inside the epithelial cell so sodium can diffuse. Does that make sense? From the lumen. Does that make sense? Did we learn the first rule of anatomy and physiology too about sodium and water? Sodium follow oh, water follows sodium, sorry. Water follows sodium. Does that make sense? Osmosis people. Okay, so you have to understand, the, we have to look at the processes somewhat static. We try to deconstruct what's going on. Does that make sense? We can't really talk about all the things at the same time, all together in the dynamic. We just can't, we just can't do it, okay? So you have to imagine sodium ions flowing into the cell and water will follow them because of the osmosis. Does that make sense? So here's your water. When water leaves the intestinal lumen, what's going to happen to concentration of other ions? It's going to go up, right? Because you remove water from the solution. You make it more concentrated. Does that make sense? As you make it more concentrated, you increase the concentration of potassium, 
and potassium diffuses into the cell. Does that make sense? Normal reaction, if I would be in your place, maybe I wouldn't speak it out loud, but my internal reaction would be, so what? What is the clinical relevance? What if you will have a toxin that will stimulate, instead of sodium diffusion and potassium diffusion, that will, say, close those channels, or better yet, will initiate the secretion of sodium and potassium into the intestinal lumen. What's going to happen to the water? Stay in the lumen. What the patient is going to experience? Diarrhea. Does that make sense? And that's why with diarrhea, not, people, not only people lose water, they also lose electrolytes. When, um, you know, when you go to the pharmacy and you buy, in case of diarrhea, you buy this Pedialyte or whatever electrolyte they sell, it has glucose, just for the sake of glucose, for the sake of energy, potassium, and sodium. And that's why it tastes so crappy, because of all the salts that are present in there. Does that make sense? You need to replenish not only water, but also electrolyte storage. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> well, those are three ions that know these mechanisms. Calcium. Calcium absorption is regulated by parathyroid hormone via vitamin D. Does it make sense? Now, if you have normal blood calcium levels and you start to drink like two gallons of milk a day, are your bones going to become bigger? No, you absorb calcium when you need it. Does that make sense? I mean, you're going to absorb some, but you're not going to absorb all of it. Do that make sense? If, say, you exercise, you put mechanical pressure, mechanical exertion on the bones, mechanical exertion stimul uh, stimulates the bone growth, or you just start shooting yourself with growth hormone and testosterone, for instance, okay? Bones start to grow, you need more calcium for bone growth. In this case, yes, calcium absorption in the intestine will increase, of course. But if there's no need, then it's going to just pass through. Does that make sense? Um, chloride. Bicarbonate has to be excreted from the intestine. So bicarbonate is excreted and chloride is actively transported via the bicarbonate chloride antiporter. Okay. Iron. Again, iron is absorbed when you need it. So, say, people with... So, women need it because for them, the blood loss is regular. Does that make sense? One of the... Now, should you take, like, iron peels or iron supplements? Not really. Because practically all food that you consume is enriched with iron. If you eat bread, it's enriched with iron. If you don't eat bread, then I presume you eat a lot of meat. Meat is naturally rich with iron. And you consume more iron normally if you don't stick to some awkward diet. You consume more iron that you need. So extra will be excreted, you know, just passed through. Iron is stored, yes, it is stored in the liver, okay? A uh, protein called ferritin stores it in the liver. Protein called transferrin shuffles the iron in the blood. When I say shuffles, it doesn't mean as a part of red blood cells. If iron is required in some other organ, 
then transferrin will transport iron. Does that make sense? Um, amount of water. You consume about 2 liters a day. I mean, it depends. Normally, people consume about 2 to 2.5 liters a day. Um, in gallons, if it's easier, it's like 2.5 quarts, a little bit more than half a gallon of water a day. Um, you don't appreciate how valuable it is to consume a certain amount of water unless somebody imposes the restrictions. When my wife was pregnant, she was told to limit her water consumption by two liters a day to avoid hypertension. You may say it's easy. By the end of the day, she went insane. Because it turns out, a lot of water you receive from food, from things like soup, she got real like breakdown of what she can drink in, you know, in a day, and there was minimal amount, okay? Um, when we say nine liters of water enter the small intestine, all it means saliva, gastric juice, pancreatic juice, all of it mucus, all of it contributes to the water intake, and the majority of it is reabsorbed in the small intestine. A little bit of it is reabsorbed in the large intestine, but majority is in the small. You lose about 100 milliliters with feces. That makes sense. And obviously, more. Now, you may say, what if I will drink like a gallon of water? Am I going to have diarrhea? No, you won't going to have, you're not going to have diarrhea. Water is going to be absorbed. And then you're going to pee it out. It's going to be excreted through kidneys. Okay? In order to keep water in the lumen, you really have to start losing electrolytes. Does that make sense? And the example that I gave you with toxins... Pretty much that's the mechanism of cholera toxin action. It stimulates the excretion of ions into the intestinal lumen and you lose water as well. Um, I kind of didn't know where to stick celiac disease, so it's kind of here. Um, it is not a myth. There is celiac disease. There are people who are allergic to gluten. Okay, gluten is the component of certain uh, plant-based foods. I will sound ignorant, but I don't have it. I don't know which food is gluten-free. I mean, I, like, I know that bread is not gluten-free, but I really don't know which one. Probably cucumbers are gluten-free, like tomatoes. Cruciferous vegetables are gluten-free. Basically, um, gluten is broken down. It binds to the um, protein, different proteins, and your immune system starts to recognize it as the antigen. It starts to respond to it, and you get inflammation in the intestines. So you just have to avoid. So that's signs of inflammation, bloating, diarrhea, pain, malnutrition. So what essentially happens when gluten is in the brush border, your immune system starts to try and destroy the gluten together with brush border. You destroy brush border, you destroy microvilli. You destroy microvilli, you impair absorption. Malabsorption, malnutrition. People with gluten intolerance, with celiac disease, have to avoid food that is rich in gluten. Is there a benefit to generally avoid gluten? There are no scientific studies which suggest that avoidance of gluten-containing food is somehow beneficial. Does that make sense? I mean, if you used to eat two loaves of bread a day and you decide to stop, that's probably going to be good for you. Just because you start consuming less carbohydrates. But overall, just abstinence of gluten doesn't carry any health benefits by itself. Good? We're moving to the fun part. And we're going to talk about some, I'm going to give you some papers and we're going to talk about those papers. I love this part, nutrition. Now on the right, 
especially in the right top. You see a pyramid, I'm, I dare to say a pyramid of bullshit. That was the original dietary recommendation produced by CDC, FDA, whoever. So you see at the bottom, like the staples of the health American diet are the plant oils, which is good, don't get me wrong, and whole grains that are represented by potatoes, I don't know why it's whole grains, and bread, which is traditionally a diet of, you know, meat was expensive and hard to get, say, 100 years ago. Of course, potatoes, of course, bread, because it was cheap, right? Staples, yeah, right. Then you have vegetables and fruits, which is good. Don't take me wrong, vegetables, good. Nuts, you know, beans, fine. Fish, poultry, and eggs, okay? Dairy and cheese, almost at the top. You should, like, consume very little of dairy and cheese, really. And on top, the good stuff, meat and butter. The best part of any diet is meat and butter. Sorry, any, if you're vegetarian, I'm sorry, but... It's great, it's, it tastes good, and you have to consume just a little bit of it. At some point, CDC produced the recommendation that we have to avoid high-fat foods. And you can see the consequences of it, first of all, on the shelves of Grocery stores, fat-free yogurt, fat-free milk, fat-free half and half. It's either half and half or it's fat-free. It can't be both, you know? So you see all these consequences now. But more daring consequence is nobody actually linked it directly. You cannot. But probably it wasn't a coincidence that obesity epidemic took off right after the recommendation to avoid high-fat food. And I will make a case that actually you should eat fat to stay lean. Okay? We'll, we'll get back to it when we'll talk about different dietary aspects. Okay? So a current recommendation that's produced by USDA is not so specific, so you got to get like a little bit of protein, a little bit of dairy, a little bit of vegetables, grains, fruits, okay? Fair enough. Again, uh, dietary recommendations are hard to make. People have different taste preferences. And you have to take dietary studies, especially the ones that are published in the mass media, with a certain grain of salt. Okay? So... There are three energy-bearing nutrients that we're going to be talking about. Carbs, lipids, and proteins. Okay? And there's going to be some science, but you have to under You know that. Carbs, it's going to be what? Bread, right? Potato, rice, stuff like that. Um, lipids, oils, fat. Proteins fish, chicken, red meat, white meat, blue meat, whatever. Okay, meat, eggs, protein. Uh, beans, a lot of protein. That makes sense. Those nutrients are energy bearing, which means they can be catabolized. And in the process of that catabolism, energy will be released. And this energy will be used for ATP synthesis. That makes sense. You also need vitamins. Vita, vita, in Latin is life. So they're necessary for life. Minerals, of course, you need salts. And you need water. Vitamins, minerals, and water are not energy bearing. Now, to give an idea, when we talk about uh, studies of 
diet. So I have a lot of quotations here. So initially, initially, the idea was that um, amount of dietary saturated fat increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> I'm going to give you this, <clears throat> probably not today. So this paper is a review, Dietary Cholesterol and Cholesterol and Natural Sclerosis. It's published in 2000. And the review pretty convincing, showing that um, increased consumption of saturated fats increase the risk of congestive heart disease mortality. Okay? And consumption of saturated fats increases the total amount of cholesterol. The last thing is not really surprising that's true. Okay? But with cholesterol, it turns out it's a little bit more complicated. Most recent studies showed that <clears throat> dietary saturated fat does not increase the risk for developing cardiovascular disease. So pretty much these studies show if you have one, you're more likely to die if you eat a lot of saturated fat. But if you don't have one, then if you consume an entire cow, you're not going to get cardiovascular disease. Does that make sense? Later, it was shown that probably unsaturated to saturated ratio is important. But still, if you would come through the literature on the role of purely saturated fat, which is butter, okay, say butter or in any animal fat, on the risk for cardiovascular disease development, the latest research, and I'm not talking about like 10 people study, massive studies, the most, the latest research show that, no, there's no correlation. No matter what you eat, unless you don't eat trans fats, which we're going to talk about, it doesn't really increase your risk for developing cardiovascular disease. Does that make sense? Let's go back to a low-fat diet. Low-fat diet means what do you, which nutrient do you eat the most? In low fat diet. Hmm? Why? No. Well, yeah, well, yes, but you can make it taste okay with things like sucralose. If you have a hypothetical food with 20% fat, 60% carbohydrates and 20% protein. No, 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 better. You have food with 60% fat, 20% carbs, 20% protein, very high fat, right? You remove all the fat. What is the carbohydrate percentage in the food be becomes? Half, immediately. Does that make sense? Just because you remove fat, your carbohydrate percentage increases. Naturally, it's it's a damn chemistry, okay? So that led to a much higher consumption of carbohydrates in the regular diet, low-fat diet. And I have a great paper here, which is called Metabolic Effects of the Very Low Carbohydrate Diets. Misunderstood villains of the human metabolism. We're gonna, not very many pictures, but we'll talk about it. Pretty much what is now demonstrated that low-carb diet, basically equal to low-fat diet in terms of the weight control, if not better, okay? So this statement from the paper by Nordman, at least as effective as low-fat energy-restricted diets. Let me translate it from scientific language to normal. Low-fat energy-restricting diet, what does that mean? You eat very low fat, 
very little fat, and you have to count how many calories you ate. Or you can start eating normal food with a lot of fat without counting calories, and it's going to work just as well, which let's, let's admit more attractive. The only thing you have to give up, though, is sugar, okay? But, you know, you can substitute it with something. Low carbohydrate, high protein diets are more effective at six months and as effective at one year, okay, in reducing weight and cardiovascular disease risk. Does that make sense? You see what they say? They say if you will switch from high, low fat to low carb, high protein, you can control weight just as well, if not better and reduce the risk for developing cardiovascular disease, okay? Now, uh, what, what are the problems? This is the very long and poorly worded statement. The idea is that if you consume diet that is rich in fat, you have to monitor your blood cholesterol, and not just blood cholesterol, but the ratio between high density and low density lipoproteins. High density is often referred to as good cholesterol, and low density is often referred to as bad cholesterol. Does that make sense? The idea of all those studies on the diet is that if you don't go absolutely insane in any way, like, I mean, yeah, you can start eating, as I mentioned, two loaves of bread and, you know, eat sugar by spoonfuls and completely exclude fat. Yeah, that's going to be ultimately high carbohydrate diet. Does that make sense? Is it going to be bad? Of course. Or you can just, you know, buy 10 pounds of lard or, I don't know, 2 pounds of butter and just eat butter with a spoon. Is it going to completely change and do it for like a few months? Is it going to change your cholesterol profile? Most likely. Unless you jump into extreme, then high fat diet seems to be at least as good, if not better, than low fat diet in terms of the weight control, which sounds quite counterintuitive. Does that make sense? Another interesting thing about diets that I think I should plug now, how often do you open a website, whatever, like news feed or something, when it says, recent study from blah, 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 found this, that eating, I don't know, Elephant dung is beneficial for you, okay? How many people? For how long? What are the control groups? There was a famous story, a, a wonderful story. A uh, science journalist wanted to debunk um, dietary studies, a lot of dietary studies. So what he did, he collected three groups of people. Each group contained 10 just 10. You imagine it's not a lot, right? And then he um, he arranged it like he had group one group eating like dark chocolate, one group eating like milk chocolate, and one group eating no chocolate. Okay? And he observed them. It was like a, a valid study. So he had doctors watching them and you know scientists taking samples and blah 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 and they were evaluating all kinds of parameters. And over a period of like two or three months, group that was eating dark chocolate demonstrated weight loss by like 15% on average. So he published these results and he exposed these results to mass media and they picked it up and there was a huge hype that dark chocolate promotes weight loss. If you will talk to statistician, 
they will tell you that if you observe groups of people, like if you compare three groups by a number of parameters, and they observed a lot of parameters, then over a certain period of time, you probably will find some significant difference in one of the parameters. So they did. Is it meaningful? Probably not, because it's only 10. Does that make sense? So always keep it in mind. When somebody tells you, oh, study such and such, how many subjects? Does that make sense? Like there is a famous Framingham study. It's a study of the city in Massachusetts, Framingham City. They, it, it, it's going on for like 50 years or something. They track people from birth. They take physiological parameters over time. They take eating habits, like dietary habits, all of it. And Framingham study suggests that, you know, like cholesterol consumption doesn't lead to cardiovascular disease and saturated fats do not lead to cardiovascular disease and whatnot. So that is a long term, a lot of people. When you talk about 10, oh, come on. Does that make sense? I hope that passionate speech made an impression on you. And we're going to talk about each individual ones, um, carbohydrates. Yeah, a little smiley face here. 50% um, of caloric intake. Yeah, right. Let me, let me quote. According to American Heart Association Nutrition Committee, um, some popular, that's a quote now, uh, quotes, some popular high protein, low carbohydrate diets limit carbohydrates to 10 to 20 grams a day, which is one fifth of the minimum 100 grams a day that is necessary to prevent loss of lean muscle tissue. There are no studies that demonstrate that humans have to consume 100 grams of carbohydrates a day. Basically, this dietary recommendation is taken up from the thin air. Okay? So, um, 10 to 20 grams a day is extremely low carbohydrate. Low carbohydrate diet is considered between 50 to 150 grams a day. High is 225 to 325. So what you see here falls in the matter of low. These numbers don't really add up on this illustration because if you talk about 130 grams, it adds up to 500 calories. It's no, it's it's impossible. Your caloric intake a day is about 2,000, okay? Does that make sense? Um, what types of carbohydrates we consume? We consume milk sugar, we consume sucrose, and we consume starch, which is broken down to maltose. Essentially, what we end up with is glucose, that's starch, fructose, which comes from sugar, just sugar, and galactose, which comes from milk. Glucose can be used directly. Galactose is converted in the liver, converted to glucose. And fructose can be directly used for the synthesis of triglycerides. We heard about high fructose corn syrup. Syrup, sorry, syrup, high fructose corn syrup. It was associated with a condition called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. High fructose corn syrup is rich in fructose. When you consume a lot of fructose, what's going to happen? In the liver, it's going to be converted to fat. This fat is going to be stored where? Surprisingly, in the liver. The liver becomes fatty. That fat is not really a quote-unquote good fat. It causes inflammation, 
Liver inflammation leads to cirrhosis. Liver cirrhosis is bad. Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> functions. Energy. First and foremost. Of course, it is needed for, you know, nucleic acid synthesis, you know, like oscillation. That's, yeah, 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 yeah. Energy. First and foremost. First and foremost, it's energy, okay? Now, um, complex versus simple carbs. Simple carbs are worst because they can bypass the um, energy bearing breakdown. You know what I'm saying? You need to spend some energy to break down, say, starch that can be found in rice or potatoes. If it's sugar, first of all, it's fructose. Second, it's broken down right away. Okay. Now, I had a privilege to, at one point, to attend a conference on obesity. I studied obesity uh, like in a mouse model for five years. But I went to the conference, it was really nice, and it was just, I, it was an eye opener. Along with molecular mechanisms, there was a lot of epidemiological studies. And, you know, obesity studies have certain sort of um, a common, have common topics, uh, story arches. You know what I'm saying? To so say uh, one of them was stress. There are many studies that link obesity to stress. There are many studies that show that consumption of protein for breakfast decreases the obesity development. One of the studies, of course, well, many studies show that processed food is directly linked to obesity. One reason is obvious, um, carbohydrate density. When we talk about processed food, what are we talking about? Pizza. Seriously, a lot of starch, a lot of sugar, a lot of high fructose corn syrup. There's another reason why processed food leads to obesity. It's palatable, which means it is tasty. Do not pretend that pizza tastes bad. It tastes awesome. All the crap that you can buy in the processed food aisle, it's good. It's incredibly tasty. You know, I still have a bag of green beans in my fridge. I will probably throw it away because they taste like, I don't know, Silas. They taste like grass, even if you cook them. You know, I do not pretend that I like them. Yeah, they, you know, dietary good, but it's crap, you know. My son eats broccoli. I still think he's an alien. He loves broccoli. You know, so this is one of the reasons why, and if broccoli would be palatable, it would be wonderful because it's low calorie density. You eat like a pound of broccoli, you don't get anything, right? Except you start farting probably. Yeah, gases. But palatable food is also very energy rich. So you tend to eat a lot of it. What's that? And did you go to, so there's, there's one rest. If you think McDonald's is the staples of American culture, it's not. Neither is Burger King or Wendy's. You know what is? Cheesecake Factory. I call it a temple of diabetes. Did you ever read the menu? First of all, they have really good, seriously, like healthy portion. Like if you order from the low calorie thing, it's pretty, it's pretty good food. I was there once and we wanted to order dessert. I think it started from 1400 calories a piece. That was not shocking. What was is the extras that they offered with the dessert. What 
can you usually find on the extras part of the menu? Hmm? What, what extra can you be offered with your dessert? Whipped cream. Okay, like some more chocolate. They offered extra 400 calories. I have a photo of it. Someone in my Google Drive. It was for three bucks or whatever the price was. You can add 400 calories to your dessert. Which I think is, is perfect. You know, don't pretend that you eat it for, I don't know, like taste. Okay? You cannot eat 1400 calories for taste. And we surprised with obesity rates, <laughs> you know? That's where it all comes from. High carbohydrate diet and all those um, calories. Now, fats. Two, well, three main groups. We're going to talk first about saturated versus non saturated. Saturated, meat and dairy. Meat has a lot, and of course, pork has more because it's just more fatty. Dairy products may have as little as, say, 3% in the whole milk to butter, which is practically fat. It's like, it is fat, okay? I'm going to give you another plug. I can find this paper if you want. There was a big study on the benefits of dairy. The study was not like just generally benefits, but it turns out that consumption of the whole milk is associated with the lower risk for developing hypertension. Seriously, it's a huge study. They showed that people who drink whole milk of low risk of hypertension. The mechanism is not really known, but that's that. Okay? Compared to those who don't drink milk at all or drink like skim or 1% or 2% milk. Make sense? Unsaturated. Uh, nuts, fatty fish, um, plant oils. We'll get to the plant oils. Trans fats. Vegetable shortening, processed fats, we'll, we'll talk about them. Uh, cholesterol, egg yolk, but a lot of fatty food contains cholesterol. Now, they all are essential. First of all, linoleic acid is essential, which means we can synthesize it and we need it for lecithin. Remember, component of bile? We need, we need linoleic acid. It Fats are energy rich. Liver and skeletal muscles are good at metabolizing them. We also can store energy in the form of fats. Uh, we need fats to absorb fat soluble vitamins. Okay, vitamin A, D, E, K. They only can be absorbed with fats because they are fat soluble. They will be a part of those micelles that enter. Um, epithelial layer. Phospholipids, you know, prostaglandins, uh, regulators of inflammation. Now, here's the deal. That's FDA recommendation. 30% of daily caloric intake, saturated fat, only 10%. This is not clear because it depends on what kind of fat is consumed. Uh, as I mentioned, more and more studies suggest that there is no convincing link between dietary saturated fat and elevated risk for cardiovascular disease. One of the problems in many studies is that you have to exclude confounding factors. Do you understand what I'm saying? If I'm a vegetarian but I smoke, my cardiovascular disease risk is higher. If I abstain from saturated fat but eat, veg eat Crisco with a spoon, not a good idea. Does that make sense? Um, now, 
Sources, yeah. So, animal sources. The main, of course, are red meat, well, meat, pork, beef, lamb, dairy. Um, poultry is less fatty, okay? Fish is really good. Fat fish, fatty fish, like herring, for instance, uh, contains a lot of unsaturated fats. Now, what about oils? You know how products promote, oh, this one is made with olive oil. Multiple studies suggest that there is no significant difference in terms of the health benefits between olive oil, sunflower oil, vegetable oil, or canola oil. They all have different percentages of different unsaturated fatty acids, but they all fairly equal beneficially fairly equally beneficial. Probably one of the reasons why olive oil got so much traction. Look at uh, Mediterranean, you know Mediterranean diet. It is rich in olive oil. You know what is what it's also rich in? Hmm? Well, fat comes from olive oil. Vegetables. They just and the reason why they eat olive oil, because they have those olives growing. Like when I was a kid, sunflower oil. Here, we came here, we went completely bonkers trying to find sunflower oil. Then we figured vegetable oil or canola is not any worse, you know, it's just different kind. And it's all good. Okay. Um, now, what if you don't consume enough fat, mostly, you know, you're going to have problems with the skin and eyes due to the lack of vitamin absorption, okay? Now, trans fats. Trans fats are bad, period. What is the difference between, okay, we're going to talk about chemistry now saturated versus unsaturated fat. Anyone took organic chemistry? What is unsaturated? Alkane. You have double bond. Like, you, there's little double bond over here. Okay? Because of this double bonds, unsaturated fats are what? Shape-wise? State-wise? They are what? No, unsaturated. Opposite. They liquid. Now, can you use it as a spread? Liquid oil. To make a sandwich. <laughs> no. So you got to make it solid, right? Also, another reason, think about isolating fat from a pig. You're going to need a lot of pigs. And it's going to be probably very painful and unsanitary process. Getting oils, fats from things like sunflower or you know, the corn is much easier. Make sense? So the idea was, okay, we're going to get this <clears throat> these oils and we're going to saturate them chemically. We're going to get rid of this double bond and we're going to make saturated fat, which is going to be solid. And that's what margarine is, or vegetable shortening, you know. That's why it's solid, because it was saturated chemically. Turns out that in the process of saturation, so-called partial hydrogenation of plant oils, you're going to get trans fats, trans configuration, okay? Um, trans fats are absolutely clearly associated with elevated risk for cardiovascular disease, they increase uh, blood, bad cholesterol levels, uh, they lead to hyperlipidemia, which means high fat in the blood, they increase um, general levels of inflammation, and this list gives you <laughs> the trans fatty acid content in different products. 
frozen foods, packaged snacks. Again, when we say about bakery products, we talk about not about bread, we talk about sweets. Okay? Does that make sense? And trans fats are just easy to handle. You buy a can of vegetable shortening and it's gonna live on your in your pantry forever, right? It's gonna it's gonna survive a nuclear holocaust. Now, as far as I know, there's a requirement, even in the United States. In Europe, it, it's been for a long time that um, food producers cannot put trans fats in the, in the food, which is good. So try to avoid. And this <clears throat> graphs here, they're really convincing, okay? So this shows you um, the changes in cholesterol levels if you replace different fats with trans fat. Okay, let me explain what it means. So you have total cholesterol, right? Like you have total cholesterol. Okay? And you have good cholesterol. You want to have as much good cholesterol as possible. Okay? Now, if the a uh, total amount of cholesterol increases, even if you have the same amount of good cholesterol, the proportion is going to be different, right? So here in this graph, you can see the proportion of total to good. The higher the number, the worse. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? This is what happens if you replace saturated fat with trans fat. The proportion goes up, which means total cholesterol increases at the expense of the good cholesterol. You replace monounsaturated fats, again, it goes up even more. You replace polyunsaturated fats, it goes up even more. Basically, it tells you that if in your diet you replace any type of fat, if you replace butter with margarine or canola oil with margarine, you're going to increase your blood cholesterol, but not in a good way. You're just going to increase the total one. Just one aspect of the changes that are associated with the consumption of trans fats. Does that make sense? And when they break it down into LDL and HDL cholesterol, and remember LDL is bad, HDL is good, what you see is that amount of bad cholesterol, proportion of bad cholesterol goes up, while the share of good cholesterol goes down. I hope I made a convincing argument towards avoiding uh, trans fats. Okay. Now proteins, um, 21 amino acid, all of which can be found only in animal protein. Which means if you consume fish, poultry, eggs, or meat, you're going to get all 21 amino acids. Why it's so necessary? Humans do not produce essential amino acids. <clears throat> we do not really, um, I don't focus on memorizing them. I'm not going to ask you which amino acid is essential, which one is not really don't, don't bother about this. You have to understand, though, that the necessary amino acids are the ones that we cannot synthesize, we cannot make inside. We have to get them with food. Uh, some soybeans contain also all amino acids, but you can't possibly consume, well, you probably can't. It's going to be a lot of farting involved. 
but you can eat a lot of beans, okay? So people who are vegetarian have to combine beans and grains to get proper amount of proteins uh, with the diet, okay? Of course, the amount of protein that you have to eat every day depends on your lifestyle. For um, generally, for instance, if you try to gain muscle mass, the general recommendation that you're going to see is that it's no less than one gram per pound, although from the latest what I saw, it's actually more than that. You can go, you can go more than that. So say if you weigh 180 pounds, we're talking about 180 grams of protein at least, which is honestly an enormous amount. Uh, you cannot possibly get it with just food. That's why people take protein supplements. It's, you cannot eat that, many ch that much chicken. Okay. If the, you eat protein-rich diet for a very long time, it leads to the lower pH of the blood. It's pretty normal. I mean, it's met pretty much it's metab mild metabolic acidosis. But if it's prolonged, it leads to the bone loss. Calcium will be removed from the bones together with phosphate to compensate for the acidity. So protein-rich diet should be also complemented with a higher intake of calcium. Does that make sense? Just to compensate for that loss. Protein function structural, of course, muscles and catalytic enzymes. Very important rule of protein synthesis is that you got to have all 21 amino acids. I mean, all types. Does that make sense? Imagine you have a protein that consists only of, hypothetically, methionine. Nothing else but methionine. Even if it's only one amino acid, you still got to have all 21 to start synthesis. Do I make sense? Um, now, in regards to the muscle gains, common mistake among the beginners is they start, they, they go absolutely crazy on the protein intake and they abandon carbohydrates. It doesn't lead to the muscle loss, but it definitely doesn't lead to muscle gain because a huge portion of the protein that is being taken with the food is used as the energy source instead of muscle buildup. So in order to increase muscle mass, it should be protein and carbohydrates. Carbohydrates will be used first as the source of energy, so proteins can be spared for the buildup of muscles. Does that make sense? Um, nitrogen balance refers to the, uh, okay, so proteins consist of amino acids. Amino acids contain nitrogen, you know, NH2 group. So you can measure how much nitrogen gets in, how much nitrogen gets out with urea. If nitrogen balance is positive, it means that the nitrogen intake in the form of protein is more than nitrogen excretion in the form of urea. That can be observed in people who grow. Athletes, kids, pregnant women. Nitrogen balance is negative when you starve. Because think about this, and we're going to come back to it again. Think about this. If you decide to go on a hunger strike, what's going to be used first. Which storage of energy? Which molecule will be used first? The G word. It's not a gl glycogen. Glycogen, you run out of gly glycogen in a matter of probably hours. What's going to happen next? What's next? Fat. Now, that depends, but you're going to run out of accessible fat storage pretty fast. What's going to be used next? Hmm? Muscles. Muscles. 
structural proteins essentially. Okay? That's going to lead to the loss of muscle mass. Um, what increases protein utilization? Insulin. It increases uptake of amino acids. Growth hormone, which stimulates protein synthesis. And sex hormones, testosterone or estrogen. They both increase protein synthesis. So those hormones are anabolic. Make sense? What increases breakdown? Cortisol. That makes sense. Now, vitamins. So these three before, those were energy bearing nutrients. This, this is not. Vitamins are rather small organic molecules that are absolutely necessary for the proper functioning of organisms. Most of them work as the cofactor or coenzymes. Do you understand the idea of coenzyme? Okay, everybody understands what enzyme is. This was a question. Everybody? We good with the term enzyme? Good? Some enzymes require little helpers. Those are coenzymes. Okay? Most the vitamins are coenzymes. The vast majority of vitamins is not synthesized in the human body. We have to take it with food. Okay? Vitamin D synthesized in skin, vitamin K in the intestine, a little bit of vitamins B are synthesized in the cells as well. Two main categories, water soluble and lipid soluble. So water soluble vitamins are <coughs> B and C, fat soluble A, D, E and K. What is the basic, biggest difference? We're going to probably like talk about just differences between fat and water soluble and then take a break. Now think about this. What is the difference? Fat soluble vitamins can accumulate in the body. That makes sense. So if you, and they actually can be toxic. You can get, say, vitamin A toxicity. You can get vitamin E toxicity if you take too much. Because they are not readily excreted. Does that make sense? Water-soluble vitamins, on the other hand, are not accumulating in the body and can be easily excreted with urine. Which brings us to the interesting question. What about those vitamin pills? You know, like they sell, you know, all the vitamins and they show in TV ads of people become stronger, uh, live longer, they become healthier, whatever. Add whatever you want. There, first of all, the problem with vitamin supplements is that what is the end point of the study? See, we can do a study does vitamin D decrease the risk for diabetes development? The answer is maybe. By the way, yeah, there were studies like that. In this case, you have a clearly defined aim of the study. Do you see what I'm trying to say? We look at the risk for diabetes. What do you want to do with multivitamins? Are multivitamins good? It's kind of very vague. Do they make you healthy? It's also vague. In the studies that were done, there was no association between vitamin, like vitamin pills intake, multivitamin intake, and decreased mortality. Does that make sense? So these pills, they're not going to make you live longer. Okay, 
You're going to spend some more money. They're not going to make you live longer. It does not mean that there are people that nobody needs vitamins. There are people that need it. Pregnant women, for instance, need folic acid often. They just don't get enough with the food. And you know, some people say, "Oh, um, but we don't get enough vitamins with food." You will be surprised that we do. If again you don't do any crazy diets, a regular person, regular human being does get enough vitamins with the food, especially since a lot of food is enriched with vitamins. Does that make sense? Now we're going to take a break and we'll come back, we'll review the quiz and we'll chat about vitamins some more.